theyeshiva.net. So I grew up in a country that some of you have heard of. It's called the United States of America. But throughout my life, I remembered the famous story, or maybe you can even call it legend, not because it didn't happen, but because it's like a legend that Reb Shimshin Rafal Hirsch, Zeichet Tzadik Levracha, had to travel from Frankfurt am Main to your wonderful country of Switzerland, and especially to the Alps, maintaining that after 120 years, when he arrives to the throne of glory, the Rebbeinu Shalom is going to ask him, have you not seen, astinish gezen, mein prechtike, glanzedike, Schweizenberg, and he won't have what to answer. So over the last week, I had the opportunity for the first time in my life to explore some of the splendid, majestic beauty of God's world in Switzerland, especially up in St. Moritz. And yesterday, as I was hiking on one of the mountains, which is why I look so good today, <laughs> I think uh, it was 12 or 13,000 feet above St. Moritz. So it was quite high up there. I almost was parallel to Bernina and to the clouds. I was almost above the clouds. I asked myself, what's the point of all this beauty? What's the objective? How does it affect me? Besides taking a picture and saying, I was there, which personally is not such a uh, important thing for me to do. And then I remembered a story that just happened a few months ago. It was far away from here. It was in a place called Stanford, Connecticut. I was in a hotel. It was actually a very interesting Shabbos. It was a Shabbos created by an organization called Renewal for people who donated a kidney to save somebody else's life. There were 800 people at the Shabbos, women and men. The common denominator was everyone sitting in that auditorium had only one kidney. I got up to speak and my opening words were, good Shabbos. I feel like I'm the only Balmum. <laughs> I'm the only, <laughs> Balmum is blemished, the only blemished human being in this room. I have two kidneys. <laughs> I have two kidneys. And it's extremely humbling because I can preach and maybe preach eloquently and pontificate and predicate zay shame, but I'm sitting in the presence of people who actually gave such a, a piece of their body to save somebody else. But most of them donated the kidney to people that they did not know. It's not like they donated it to a brother, to a father, to a child. Most of them, 99% of the think one or two people, gave it to people that they did not know. They did not know who's getting their kidney. It was really, really incredible. Just parenthetically, the next day, a few days later, I was interviewed on a radio show in New York. And the person says, what do you say about the fact that Orthodox Jews are not menschlich? They don't hold the door open, they're not always polite, they're sometimes abrupt. There's certain Jews in uh, New York sometimes that you know, could be, not Switzerland, I know. <laughs> I don't mean to make a Xerxes show, Khalil. I said, you know, interesting fact, just yesterday I was at a weekend with people who donated their kidneys, Orthodox Jews, and I wanted to know what the statistics are in the United States of America, the percentage, who gives kidneys. And I found out that 18% of kidney donors are Shaymre Tayro Mitzvah. 18% of kidney donors. I want to tell you something. I think it's important for people to be polite. But if I would need a kidney for myself or my loved one, I know who to turn to. So it's important to focus on politeness, but also remember about substance. The person was quiet at least for a few seconds. Shabbos afternoon, I'm walking in the hallway and a person comes over to me. A young man, looks like in his early 30s, and he shares, says, you know, I never shared this story with anyone in my life. I didn't even share it with my wife, he says, or with my parents, because I just felt too ashamed. But something you said 
triggered me that I have to reveal this story. And this is what this young man told me. He said, I grew up in New York, in America. And he said, I had the unique privilege that within eight years, I was thrown out of 10 yeshivas. I said, why? He said, everybody wanted me. I went from one place to another place to another place. Everybody wanted a taste of me, but not more than a few months or a few weeks. I was 14, he said, it's a Guinea Book of World Records. A few years, literally 10 yeshivas. The next few years, another few. I was 14, my father called me in. And he said, I have nothing to do with you. And from my perspective, this is a hopeless situation. Go to Israel and figure your life out. I asked him, did you ever speak to your father about your struggles? There was nobody to speak to because when I would come home, my father would punish me worse than I was punished in the shula, in the cheder, in the school. So I never spoke to him. So 14, he shipped me off to Israel. I'm alone in the world. He tells me, I go into a, to a shul in B'nai Brak, who was the slum in the shul in B'nai Brak. And he says, they're sitting there an old Jew, the Usher Arkovich. Usher Arkovich was in his 90s. He was a partisan in the Second World War. He survived in the forests. He lost his family. He remarried. His <coughs> wife died a few years earlier. <coughs> and he was alone, and he never had children after the war. He was sitting in davening shachrus in B'nai Brak in a slum in Mishul. He was a Hasidic Jew from slum. And it was later in the morning, so the shul was already empty. And he was sitting in Talos and he would sit for hours, a Jew in his 90s, and he would daven, he would walk outside and say Pesukah de Zibra, and he would point, Harim v'chal gvoye, say Tzpri v'chal arozim, ha'chayim v'chal ba'ema. He would point to all the props in God's world when he was davening. He sees me, and he says, what are you doing here? As a shul, 11 o'clock in the morning, you don't have a yeshiva? I say, actually not. Uh, I've already been in 10 yeshivas. And my father sent me here to Israel. And I have to find a place for myself. I don't have some here. And this boy, this man tells me. He says, because Bachir will come over here. He says, I want to tell you something. That the Magid of Lechevich once said, it actually comes from the Baruch of Mezhuk, which is the grandson of the Moshev. And he opened up an ashray, and he said, you know, we say every single morning, we say three times a day, we just said it a few minutes ago, K'vayd malchuscha yemeiru, u'k'vuroscha yedabeiru, lo'idiya levnei adam v'roisa v'k'vayd adar malchusa, which means, the glory of your kingship, they declare, your strength, they speak about, Lahidia to notify people, Gvuraisov, the majesty of the Rebbeinu Shalaylam, Uchvayd Adar Malchusay, and the glory and beauty of his kingship. So we talk about Kvayd Shamayim, so people understand something of the infinite majesty of Hashem. But this man, Abba Sharkovich, tells this 14 year old boy, he says, But I'll tell you what the Lechem Shamagit said. He said there's a deeper interpretation. And the deeper interpretation is, why is it that Hashem wanted we should sing His praises and His glory day in and day out? I mean, let's face it, even people and those of us who like compliments. In the Shvites, how many compliment in the Not live? Okay, so you could relate to it. Even those of us who love validation and compliments, right? You want your wife to compliment you, and your shvigar to compliment you, good luck, and your husband to compliment you, and you, everyone you want to compliment you, and your mechut and your tennis and your friend. Even those, after 50, 100 compliments, come in Meshiva. You can go crazy. How many compliments do we offer Hashem every day? You ever read through Davening with a translation that you can understand the words? The Psukha de Zimra, and the Brachas, and Birchas Krishna, and the Brachas afterwards, and the Tfilas. It's a lot. And the question is why? Why is it so necessary? <coughs> so, Kvayd Malchuscha Yemeiru Gvraski Dabeir. Hashem wants that His glory, His covet, should be spoken about. Why? Why? And the answer is, He tells this boy, I'll tell you why. Lo Hidiya Livnei Ha'odom To notify people, to notify each person about His and her own strength. Kvayd Hadar Malchusa. And Rabbi Baruch of Mezhebuch says, Lo it's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah wherever you go. Lo let 
people know the idea of Adam, every person you come in contact with, let him or her know about Gvuroisov, about their strength, their power, their majesty, their greatness, their splendor. Let the person know the glory, the beauty of his or her sense of dignity, of malchus, of leadership, of empowerment, of kingship. So when I'm talking about Hashem's infinity, that means something else as well. If Hashem is infinite and He created me and my soul is a piece of Him, what does that really mean? It means that I am infinite. It means that you are infinite. If your soul is a chelik eleikam imal mamish and your body is sacred, and an imprint of the divine image, but Salam Alakim Asas Adam, or as the Zoyar says, Gufa the Lion Kadisha, Nishmas the Lion Kadisha, the body is sacred, the soul is sacred. So when you talk about Hashem's infinity, Hashem's limitlessness, it means you're really telling a person, Who are you? You're not small, you're not petty, you're not a victim of circumstances. If you are an embodiment and a manifestation, of the divine in this world. If you are an ambassador of Hashem, as the Gemara says in Kiddush and Amal of Shluchai, Shal Adam Kemoisa, a Shliach, a messenger, an ambassador of a Meshaleh, halachically in Jewish law, represents the person who sent him or her. You assume the identity to some degree of the person who sent you, so that Shluchai Shal Adam Ha'elioi Kemoisa. So if you understand that every soul was sent, sent by Hashem into this world, then who are you? You embody the Meshaleach, the one who sent you. Shlucha Shaladam Kemaisa. Every person you meet, lo idea. Tell them. And not just tell them with words. Lo idea comes from the word das. Vaha Adam, Yoda es chavo. Adam nu chavo. It doesn't mean they went on a date. It doesn't only mean that he looked up her resume. Vodam Yodez Chava means there was connection. Das means when something is perceived in a way that it's visceral, it's real, it's intimate. Vodam Yodez Chava means there was intimacy, as you could see from the continuation of the Pasuk. So Lohidiya means I internalize it. Let every person internalize. Gvuroi Sav. His or her own You're singing God's praises and simultaneously you're telling yourself and you're empowering everyone you come in contact with. Their own inner, inner power and infinity and light. Rab Usher said this all briefly in Yiddish and he turns to this boy and he says, listen, I don't know where you're going and I don't know how many yeshivas you were in and how many yeshivas you will be in. But just remember your gvura and your malchus. Haba, guten tag, have a good day. And he leaves the shul. He gets into another yeshiva. Six months later, he's expelled. He gets into another yeshiva, and there's strong. Six months later, he's expelled. He says, it's been a year in Israel, and now I've already been in 12 yeshivas. I couldn't call my father because he was no source of comfort. And he looks at me, he says, I'm 15 years old, I'm alone in the world, and I feel that nobody wants me. There's literally not a soul that wants me, that's interested in me. He says, the pain was so acute, it's hard to describe how intense the pain was. And I decided I have no future in this world, and I'm going to do the unthinkable. And he describes this to me, he says, it's one morning, I'm in Yerushalayim, and he tells me exactly the street and the address of the building, and I go up to the roof of the building. It's a very active and vibrant day in Yerushalayim and Jerusalem. And I'm going to jump off the roof. And he says, I'm at the edge. And I'm pacing back and forth, back and forth. My depression has taken over every bone of my body, every fiber of my being. As I'm looking down and preparing for this moment that will take me out of my misery. Rechayv doivev mesharim number 11 on the roof. I have a flashback of a 95-year-old partisan who has no wife, who has no children, really alone in the world, who says, listen, whatever happens to you, 
Just remember, Never forget your kingship, your royalty, your majesty, your strength. And I think to myself, you know, before I jump, I have to figure out my strengths. And then I'll do it. He said, at that moment, I literally went down. And here I am today, a father of three children, married happily, very, very successful business, donated a kidney to save somebody's life. And the first time I'm sharing this story with anybody, I looked at him and I said, why do you think his words had such an impact on you? And he says, because there was no ulterior motive. They were authentic. I knew who this man was. I knew what he went through. I knew that his words were not coming with an agenda. There was no flattery. There was no superficiality. So he meant authentish. It was authentic. It was MS. It was real. It touched my heart. It penetrated me. And then I thought to myself, the Russian passed away a few years ago, but I thought to myself, could have he ever known the impact of that statement of reading one Pusik in Ashray correctly? Could he have ever known the impact of how it saved a life? Does anybody ever know the impact of their warmth, of their words? on another soul. And then I thought, ah, I remember the Svasemis. Svasemis says, why is it that people are mesmerized and enthralled by tall mountains and by gigantic, awesome seas and oceans? Why do people love going to the beach and just watching the Mayan, watching the water, or gazing or climbing, scaling a mountain? Why? He says, because both of these realities remind your soul of your own expansiveness, of your own grandeur, of your own infinity. Because often the circumstances of life can make you feel so small, especially if you experience trauma in childhood, especially if you've experienced disappointments, especially if you're struggling with mental illness or you're struggling with mood disorders or personality disorders, or you're struggling with deep psychological and emotional vicissitudes, or you're struggling inside or externally with things that are not easy. And you come to a world, and often there's plenty of people to remind me how small, how petty, how unpredictable I am. There's enough people and situations that could remind me I'm a loser, I'm unworthy. And then the person comes and sees that mountain. And the Svasemna says, and it's a trigger. It's a good trigger. It tells, it reminds you, you're not small. You're a sula mutzavatza viroishoi magia shamaima. You may be standing on the ground, but your head reaches heaven. So why are you standing so deep in the ground? Because only you can be the interlacing link between heaven and earth. Only the human soul can go from so high to so low, and instead of falling, it can transform darkness into light, bitterness into sweetness. You stand in front of the sea, in front of the ocean, and you see the Mayim She'elam Saif, and in a subconscious or conscious way, you remember your own infinity, like the of Nadam The beauty that Rav Shimshon Rafal Hirsch was craving to see, I maintain, is not just another photograph that he could put on his Instagram account, if I'm not mistaken, Rabbi Shimshon Rafal Hirsch did not have MS. <laughs> in the 18, early 1880s or 1870s, I'm not sure it existed yet. But there's a different type of beauty. Hashem says, did you see Hostigizen mein Schweiz, Hostigizen mein Alpen, Hostigizen mein St. Maritz, Hostigizen mein Berg? Which means, did you see yourself in my mountains? Did you see yourself in my world? Did you see my, yourself in my beautiful universe? Did you understand that if these mountains were no mistake, you also are no mistake? If this world is so majestic and splendid, so orchestrated and so fine-tuned, so delicious and so vibrant, 
so profound and so expansive. Do you think when I conceived you, I made a mistake? You think you're just a random mutation? An infinitesimal droplet on the surface of infinity amounting to nothing? It's hard. We live in a time when there's so much prosperity on one level, and yet internally, people struggle, and struggle more than we imagine. And I would say it's true about all people, but Jews have deep, deep complexes that come from two, three thousand years, two thousand years of gullus trauma. In fact, I think in my whole life I only met one Jew who has not felt guilty about himself. And that Jew has been in therapy for years, <laughs> trying to figure out why he doesn't feel guilty. <laughs> it's hard. You know, the, 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 Jew, the Jew is given profound power, profound power. And when you have profound power, either you embrace it or you have to reject it. It's very deep. Which is why, you know, there's a, a kosher restaurant in New York. You'll come visit, you'll see a few kosher restaurants over there. They like eating there. So kosher. There was a radio going around from table to table, and she asked one question. Is anything all right? <laughs> struggle. Jews have struggled with their identity very, very profoundly. I was once talking to a group of very secular Jews, and I said, I want to tell you my feelings about the Jewish people. You know, the Gemara says in Shah, I'll tell you my story, I didn't say this to them. The Gemara says in Shah, is the Kofi Yates on the base. Al Tigui be Meshichai, Helu, Tinoikus shall base Rabba. Don't touch my anointed ones. We say it every morning in Haidu, either before Baruch Shem or after Baruch Shem. I don't want to get involved in Ashkenaz or Sfar, but whatever you daven, we say it. <coughs> Rabbi Shapiro once said, whether you say Haidu before Baruch Shama, you say Baruch Shama after Haidu, the main thing is by Yehich Vayd Hashem Lo'aylam, everything, everybody comes together. If not, then we have Tzadus. Then we have Tzadus. And the truth is, one of, I think, the greatest blessings of the well-known community in Switzerland is, I, I visited, I think, 600 or 700 communities around the world is, that even though there's so many different types of Jews that come from different backgrounds, so the Yakisha, so the Chsidisha, to the Litvisha, to the Diskreis and Yenekreis, but relatively speaking, there's a sense of, of understanding that everyone has to stay together, unified, connected, and interconnected. And when we have that, we're more powerful than anything. So the uh, Yichvoid Hashem Loyalam has to come together. I don't know if you ever visited, but in San Francisco, you have what's called the Sequoia Trees. The redwoods, they're called redwoods. Those are trees that have been around for 3,500 years, some of them 4,000 years. So you look at a tree, and this tree was around during Yosef, Yaakov, Yitzchak, maybe Mr. Shalach, Poitifar, Poitifar's wife. The, literally the, the same time in history. It's unique, it's before Moshe Rabbein. Moshe is 3,300 years, and this goes a few hundred years earlier. Scientists wanted to understand what's the secret of the sequoias? What's the secret of the redwoods? How do trees survive 3,500 years? California forest fires, bacteria, liberalism. <laughs> <laughs> trees are deaf. They hear only what they want to hear. They don't read all the newspapers and all the WhatsApps that everybody else reads. Barker, they're smart. Trees are smart, smarter than we think. But what's the secret? What's the secret? How do you survive 4,000 years? It's a good question. So they naturally thought that the roots must extend hundreds of feet deep into the earth. A few years ago, when they developed the technology, they took a look, and to their astound astonishment, they noticed that the roots of the sequoias are very shallow. Some of them go four or five feet in depth, and that's it. And they couldn't understand. How does this miracle of nature happen? And then they realized something astounding. You could look it up. What the trees don't have in depth, in, in depth they make up in breath. What the sequoia does in its brilliance is, as the roots begin developing, and they go down and they spread 
to look for nutrients and water so that the tree can function and live and produce, these roots look and they seek out the roots of other sequoias. And when they find the roots of the other sequoias, you know what they do? They interlock themselves with the other roots. And they literally, they marry them, they become entangled and interconnected. So knipt und zubunden, they now become interlaced and you can have a hundred sequoia trees that their roots are all interlocked and interlaced with each other. In depth they're shallow, but in breadth you can have a hundred trees. Above the surface each tree has its own distinct personality, shape, flavor, dimension, pezendigkeit, unique genetic physiological makeup. But subterranean, unto the edge, they're all one. Nothing could destroy them. And then I got it. I'm like, the Jews are the sequoias of history. <coughs> the prophet says, you're like a tree. We are the sequoias of Jewish history. What was the secret of the human sequoia? What was it? Where's Paroi? Where's Nebuchadnezzar? Speaking about the three weeks. Where's Titus? Where's Vespasian? Vespas where's Adrian? Where's Caliglia? Where's Caesar? Where's Tiberius? Where's Pompey? Where are they? And the answer is they're in Wikipedia. They're all there. We are the Jews, and the answer is we created Wikipedia. <laughs> together with Google, together with Facebook, together with Instagram, Telegram, and even Waze. <laughs> we like to edit our enemies. You can Google Wikipedia, you can go to Titus or Homo, and you can edit the obituary. We like writing the obituaries of our enemies. But not only writing their obituaries, we also like eating them turning them into foods. The best Jewish foods come from our worst enemies. We took paro and we turned them into a matzo ball, a knegel. We took antiochus and we turned them into a latke. We took haman and we turned them into a hamantash. We don't only want to watch our enemies defeated, we want to eat them. We want haman to contribute to our cholesterol, to our fat reserve, to our glucose treasure. It was a dedication of a mikvah in Brooklyn. One year Hanukkah, the president of Brooklyn College came. She's a wonderful Irish woman. So she saw everybody really attacking the latkes. As is the custom, not in Switzerland, of course, but in other parts of the world where people attack schmuggers boards. I don't know if you ever seen it. Sinish does a, uh, does a fai, an eagle. But whatever, you know, if I always explain to the, to the Maitre G's that you have to understand Jews. For Jews, when they see dinner, in their imagination, it might be, might be the last supper. <laughs> you have to understand. And, and the last supper, you don't take chances. I mean, if you haven't traveled with Jews on airplanes, you haven't traveled with Jews on airplanes, to, you go from New York to Montreal, it's an hour flight. You're going to Shalom. They come with meals, polkas, and sushi, eggs, and chocolate. I say, why? He says, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> It's called trauma. I get it. I get it. As I use this. Yeah. You remember there was an airline called Tower Air. You remember Tower Air? So they were once traveling to Israel. It was Hanukkah time. So they landed in Tel Aviv and the captain says to all those who are sitting, Happy New Year. To all those who are standing, Happy Hanukkah. It was, there was a, the other day, interesting, it was an L out flight going from New York to Israel. Diabetes is a lot in those flights. Not like here, it's four hours, it's 11 hours. So 11 hours with Micha, Amcha, Yisrael, Be'echad, Barnes. First of all, there's Minchen, and there's Mayrim, and then there's Adaf Yoimi, and then there's Bavli, and there's Yerushalmi. Somebody has to make a Siyam Mishnayis, somebody has to do Tikkun Chatzoy, somebody has to do Tikkun Akloli, somebody has to do from Oman. It's Lebedek, my friend. So this guy, this poor guy, he wanted to sleep, he was exhausted. So he put up a sign by his chair. The sign read as follows. I David Mincha, I David Maiden, I do not want to die on I don't have a sitter, I don't have a tiller, I don't have an art scroll gemara. 
I don't have pacifiers, I don't have baby wipes, I don't have herring, I don't have sushi, I don't have kichla, I don't have a chumash, I don't have a chakli yisrael, I don't have a mishnayis, I don't have the baba salis, zgulas, and kameis for turbulence. I don't have tissues, I don't have napkins, I don't have pampers. He thought he's covered. <laughs> Jews would not have any interest in him. He has nothing to offer. He'll be able to sleep 11 hours via Gute Schweizer Hishigot. Five minutes into his sleep, somebody is poking him in the ribs. It's always in the ribs, in the knee, right? Somebody's poke. He looks a little kid. A little kid. He looks at him. He says, Lay the tzettel. Read the sign. Boy says, I read the sign. Read it again. I read it. I'm not asking any of these things. Read it again. I read it. What do you want? He says, stuck it for the vision itself. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. So, the secret of the sequoias is, Mahal Tzachzazam. Above the earth, you don't have to be one. Ain't they saying, shall we? You don't have to be one. Two Jews, 19 opinions. That's fine. I once heard myself in the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He said, why is it that a Jew meets another Jew and he says, Shalom Aleichem? And the response is, Aleichem Shalom. Why not reciprocate? Shalom Aleichem, Aleichem Shalom. Imagine in English. I say, good morning, and you say, morning good. <laughs> good evening, evening good. Good avid, avid good. How are you? You are how? What's up? Up what? <laughs> Strange, right? But in Hebrew, we do it every day. Shalom Aleichem. No, Aleichem Shalom. Why not Shalom Aleichem? Shalom Aleichem. And he said, because when two Jews meet, even before they begin a conversation, the first thing is we have to establish that there's a disagreement between them. <laughs> shalom Aleichem. Nah. Shalom. Aleichem Shalom. Once we have established that we disagree, now we can hopefully go on to have a civil conversation. Above the earth, every tree needs to have its uniqueness. I don't have to copy you. They say everyone is born an original. No need to die as a copy. They once asked a 106-year-old woman, what's the advantage of living till 106? And she said, less peer pressure. <laughs> Above the surface, what did Bullock say? We start every morning our prayers with Bullock's immortal words. Their doors are not parallel to each other. Who cares if the doors are parallel to each other? It means I don't have to look into your house to see what you're doing before I decide what I have to do. I don't have to make my bar mitzvah based on your bar mitzvah, my kitchen based on your kitchen, my wedding based on your wedding. Create the schedule for my children the way I can learn from people. I don't have to copy people. Everyone has their unique mission, their unique gifts, their unique challenges, their unique opportunities, their unique shlichas. That's above the earth. Under the earth, the sequoias need to be one. The sequoias have to be interlocked and inter... It's like in a marriage. Do you think a good marriage is a marriage where husbands and wives never disagree? A nechtiketak. A Jewish couple. <laughs> Good marriage doesn't mean I'm good. They used to think good marriages, everybody agrees. Bad marriages, they don't agree. It's not true. All real research on marriage shows that even in the best marriages, 70% of arguments that they had during Shabbat Brachas, they still have at the age of 99. <laughs> Which means, Be'ezer Hashem, in 70 years, you'll still be arguing. Where do we go for Pesach? <laughs> what do we do for the summer? Megay Dorkta, Megay Din. The only thing you won't be arguing is, do we go to the Shvigya for Shabbos? Because at that point, she'll be 162. <laughs> All arguments, most arguments persist. Why? Because what undermines a relationship is not an argument. What undermines a relationship is a sense that there's no trust, there's no loyalty, there's no love, there's no camaraderie. So kind. The whole culture of Yiddishkeit, the whole Gemara, is based on a culture of arguments. There's not a page in Shas that's not saturated with debates and arguments. That is not a tragedy. On the contrary, my wife disagreeing with me allows me to expand my horizons. 
and see beyond my ego and my insecurity. Arguments can be extremely beneficial to discover truth as long as the underlying foundation of the argument is I love you, I'm here for you, I cherish you, I have your back a thousand percent. Then it's different. That's the secret of the sequoia tree. Make sure the Nusach Sfar and the Nusach Ashkenaz come together. And so, every morning we say, Don't touch my Mashiach. Don't touch my anointed ones. Zog the Gemara, who is that? Elu? Tinoikas shall be These are the children. Why, are, why is every Jewish child called a Mashiach? One reason is because the pressure of Jewish parents. <laughs> I understand. You can't just be a regular kid. You've got to change the whole world. Okay. But there's something very authentic here. I'll tell you, whenever you remember when you were a child, and every one of us, you were four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You remember how you would dream? Especially when you went on dacha, or you went on vacation, you had a little time off, you went into nature. You're a little kid, you dream. You dream dreams of grandeur. You dream that either you're going to change the world or you're going to help others change the world. But then I get older and we get jaded. These have been jaded of Schweitzerdisch, Yiddish, Deutsch. Huh? From the mood. Okay, that's the correct thing. Reb Simcha Binem of Shizcha once said, he said, if a person loses their money, it's not fun, but they didn't lose anything. Money comes, money goes, as some of you know very well. A person loses their health, or part of it, he says, that's difficult. But it's half of them. They still have a soul, they have a healthy soul. He says, oh, but I meant shvalir, the mood, the courage. If a person loses their spirit, their courage, their energy, their vibrancy, they lose everything. I get older and I become jaded. I, I forget my dreams of youth, especially if you were robbed from your innocence, if you were robbed from your youth. I hope not everybody understands what I'm talking about, but those of you in the crowd who understand what I'm talking about, yes, you understand what I'm talking about. You were robbed from that innocence, and you had to replace your innocence with a fake personality like those they have in the wax museums. You ever went to the wax museum in London? Yeah, Churchill is with a cigar, and I once had a mentor, a teacher who was a little absent-minded, and he would smoke, and he went over to Churchill in the Wax Museum, and he asked him for a match <laughs> to light his cigarette. It looks real, but it's fake. And some of us were forced, because of abuse, or because of inappropriate behavior by the hands of others, to replace our true, authentic personalities with fake personalities subconsciously. And when I grow older, I am so jaded, I am so not trusting, I am so cynical. I am so fed up. So Chazal say, Al Tigri, the Rebbeinu Shlevim says, Al Tigri the Mashiach, Elu Tigri the Shlevim Never allow the little Mashiach in you to die. Never allow the child in you to perish. Al Tigri the Mashiach, never touch a child. Never take away from the child his or her dream, his or her empowerment, his or her ability to be able to see themselves for who they really are. A tall mountain that starts on earth, its grounding is on earth, but its peak reaches heaven and above the heaven. Far taller than the mountains of St. Moritz. Even Karavac and Benina and their friends. Sorry for my uh, New York Karavac. It sounds Hungarian almost. I was the Schweiz is not hungry. Almost like Sala Kokash. So I'm speaking to this group of secular I say, I'll tell you the truth. When I see Jews, every Jewish child, I want to tell you something. It's like, a, imagine Mozart, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who lived not so far from here, growing up in a house without a piano. What would have happened to this Mozart? The genius would have not been obliterated, but the outlet would have been probably destructive. Thank God Mozart grew up in a home with a piano. So the genius had an outlet. Every Jewish child is a little Mozart. Torah is the piano. And that's why you'll see 
Jews have a revolutionary spirit. And Jews who have not had the piano, the outlet, the genius came out, but in very, very powerful and sometimes not constructive ways. Look at the four people who define modern days. Four people. Remember, we don't constitute even 1% of humanity. You know that. Jews don't constitute even a quarter of 1% of humanity. Not one and not a quarter. Which means the number of Jews is smaller than a statistical error on a Chinese census. Repeat that in your mind to yourself. And yet you look, who are the four Jews who shaped modernity? Four people. Karl Marx, who transformed politics with his manifesto of socialism. Albert Einstein, Time Magazine named him the man of the century, transformed science and physics. Sigmund Freud, his real name was Schleimel of Freud, also didn't live far from here, the father of psychoanalysis. Everyone who's in therapy today, or should be in therapy. <laughs> Somehow Freud gets the credit. There's three types of Jews. Psychotics, neurotics, and psychiatrists. The psychotic, psychotics build castles in the air. The neurotics live in them. The psychiatrist collects the rent from both. <laughs> and the rent is steep. So you have Einstein, you have Marx, you have Freud, and biology, Charles Darwin. Changed our perspective of biology. Einstein, Marx, Freud, and Darwin. Three of them were Jewish, Darwin was wrong. <laughs> but I always wondered, Darwin became such a good apicurus, why wasn't he Jewish? Usually such levels of heresy are reserved for the Jewish people. You have a, you have a Marx, ah, apicurus. You have a Freud, akidichta, apicurus. What happened? Why is it? That's why that Charles Darwin wasn't zeichet to be a Jew. And then I realized it must have been a random mutation. <laughs> some error, some mistake. And then I understood. Hashem tells Moshe, don't count Jews. You're not going to count Jews. How do you count Jews? Zeyitnu. Every Jew gives a contribution, and you count the money, the machtas hashekel. Why? Till today, you walk into a show, they're looking for a minion. It sounds strange to somebody who was never there. This one is going, not one, not two, not three, not four. <laughs> this one is hungry, so he goes, <laughs> Why can't you count Jews? What's the big one? You get the one, two, three, it's dangerous. You're not going to count Jews. Was this just a clever way of making an appeal? We want a census, we need money. Well, what's the point? Why does God care if we count Jews? The answer, my friends, is very simple and very profound. Why do nations make a census? Why? The answer is to flex their muscles, to show their prowess. If a company can say we have 3,000 employees, if Google says we have 15,000 employees, wow! If a country says we have 1.5 million troops, wow! If a country can boast numbers, it means the revenue is greater. The workforce is greater. The military is greater. It's power. God knew that if Jews are going to start counting themselves, they're going to go into a depression. Less than a quarter of 1% of humanity. How can we survive? Never mind, how can we have an influence? So the Rebbein Yishlam told Moshe Rabbeinu, don't count Jews. You know how you count Jews? Ze yitnu. Look at their contributions. Look at what they have given the world. That's how you count the Jewish people. You don't count them through numbers. You don't count a school, you don't count a people, you don't count a nation or community through numbers. Zeitnu, count, look at the contribution. And you can see even from a secular perspective, there were 900, approximately 950 Nobel Prizes since Alfred Nobel introduced the Nobel Prize for economics, for literature, for peace, for biology, for physics, and for medicine. medicine, 950. If we don't make up even a half or a quarter percent of civilization, how many Jews should have won the Nobel Prize, statistically? A quarter of a Jew, a half a Jew, one Jew, right? This 1.9 billion Muslims. <laughs> 2.8 billion Catholics, 
1.2 billion Chinese. The fact is, four Muslims won the Nobel Prize, and one of them was, of course, Yasser Arafat for peace. <laughs> Jews have won, in some areas, close to 40% of the Nobel Prize. Some areas, 30%, 35%, 28%, 37%. Wow. Is this Meshuggah? Hashem says, don't count Jews. Zayitnu. <coughs> count what they give. This is in terms of secular contributions. In terms of spiritual contributions. The prophets, the sages, the mystics, the holy men and women, fathers and mothers. An incessant flow. Al-Tigui bin Meshichai. I told these Jews, you are Mozarts, you need pianos. You need outlets to express your revolutionary spirit, to change the world in ways that's going to build the world. The Sakin Oilam, the Malchus, Shindalad Yud. The worst crime I can do to a child or to an adult is snuff out that soul, that spirit, that oomph. That spirit of redemptive consciousness that lurks in every child's innocence and beauty and splendor. <clears throat> you know, my dearest friends, first time I heard the story, it left me both without a dry eye and without, almost my breath was taken away. It was in Deal, New Jersey. I was giving a lecture there were 80 Jewish organizations, social organizations, that deal with abusive situations in the Jewish community. And you know, for many many years, they used to say that American Jews like Hollywood kitchens and wall-to-wall -wall carpets. You know why wall-to-wall -wall carpets? Because we had a lot of things to put under the carpet. <laughs> we like to bury things, just the way we are. And maybe it was good for survival. But there comes a point in history where the Rebbeinu Shalom turns to the Jewish people and says, stop surviving, start thriving. You survived, and you did well, you did well, amazing, we survived. Our parents survived, our grandparents survived, our great-grandparents survived. They deserve not one standing ovation, but they deserve a standing ovation that extends for a thousand years. The greatest generation in history, they came out of gas chambers 75, 80 years ago, and they turned their face to rebuild. They got married, I was once at a Sheva Brachis, and an Auschwitz of a survivor of the Holocaust came over to me. His name was Rabbi Chiel ben Sian Fischer. He just passed away a few months ago. It's a Ger Chusset. And he looks at me, and he says, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, you know what the greatest miracle about Holocaust survivors like me are? I said, tell me. He says, we try to make believe that we're normal. And we try to live normal lives. He says, that's the greatest miracle. We try to live normal lives, even though a part of us is not normal. Part of us has died in the camps. But we try to be normal. Unbelievable generation, unbelievable generation. And now we have our generation, our generation. It's sad every day we hear about the last Sha'iris I played the Eden, those who lit the torch and went Lifnei Amachin and the Ud Mutzel Mayesh the brands rescued from the fire, who rebuilt Klal Yisrael after Treblinka and Bergen-Belsen and Mauthausen and Auschwitz, Birkenau. They rebuilt Klal Yisrael. They rebuilt Eretz Yisrael. They rebuilt Klal Yisrael. They rebuilt communities and families the world over, including right here in Switzerland. And now is a new generation. The Svasema says, it says, Schoer yemois oilu, binu shnois doir v'doir. Remember the days of history, understand the years of a generation. And he says, Shnois comes from the word Shinui. Binu Shnois Dervadar. You also have to understand the changes from a generation to a generation. You have to understand Shnois. Not every generation is the same. I once heard from Dr. Tversky, remember Rabshia Tversky, Dr. Abraham Tversky is a Khan of Rocha, famous psychiatrist. He once said, I don't understand. After the Mabel, Noyach was, how old was he? 600 years old, 601 years old. And he says l'chaim and he gets drunk. It was the first time he drank in 600 years. There was no drinking then before. He says, what happened? So the answer is, before the flood, Noyach could drink big cups. It's called Zexanitzika in Russian. 96% alcohol. It worked. After the flood, 
It was a new generation. Noyach used the same cup. He didn't realize that the cup is different. You have to know the difference of a generation. Comes this generation, God turns to the Jewish people and says, Now I don't only want you to survive. Now I want you to thrive. I don't only want you to use your coping mechanisms to survive. Now I want you to be able to bring out the greatest power in yourselves so that you can bring out the power in others. It's time to graduate from a consciousness of exile, of fakmechkeit, of tzimtzum, of narrowness, of restrictiveness. You can change the world if you only appreciate that you're a conduit for divine infinity, a derivative of divine consciousness. So a lot of things are coming up now. And we, some of us, want to put it under the carpet. But now it's not common anymore to have wall-to-wall -wall carpets. The balabusters don't hold of it. <laughs> In other words, everything is out in the open. I was speaking today to a group of educators. So I said, you know, why is it we hide the Afrikaiman? In the beginning of the Seder, and who finds the Afrikaiman? The children. It's called Tzafa. Because whatever we hide, our children are going to find. And they're going to reveal it. They're going to say, Hey, Tati. Hey, Mommy. What do you do at that moment? Defines who you are. At that moment, you either get angry at your children for exposing the hidden skeletons, or you tell your children, Thank you. Thank you. Let me embrace the Afikaiman together with you, and then together you can say, Lashana Habab Yerushalayim. Only if we can embrace the Afikaiman. So I was giving this lecture in Deal about a lot of these struggles and these issues that people were having. And a Jew who was there comes over to me afterwards. He's a professor of psychology in Yeshiva University. His name is Dr. David Pelkovitz. And he says to me, I want to share with you something that happened in my office that vindicates everything you said in your speech. He's a psychologist. He lives in New York in Riverdale, in the five towns. His father was a famous rabbi of the White Shield, passed away a few years ago. And he says, a long time ago, a quarter of a century ago, a boy came into my office. I say, why are you here? He says, my father wanted I should go to therapy. I said, why? Because I'm not a yeshiva. So I turn to the boy, and I start talking to him, and he tells me, Rabbi Wyatt, I fell in love with this kid in a few minutes. He was like an amazing boy. And at the end, I'm like, I don't think you need therapy. Your father probably needs the therapy. <laughs> Next week, bring in your father and your mother, bring in your siblings, and bring in your grandparents. I said, Dr. Pelkovitz, I never heard of this. You're bringing in Zaydas and Bubba's to therapy? What do you want, an 87-year-old woman to start talking about her emotions towards her mother? <laughs> Today, we have the luxury to have emotions about our mothers. Then, if you had a mother, you were already better off than most of the world. You had a mother and bread on the table. You were Mamish, Mashiach Said, who had time to explore my emotions, my father, my mother, my this. He was surviving. He says, you're right, but I had a hunch to do it, and I have to follow my hunch. So the next week, Tati comes in, Mommy comes in, the siblings come in, and the grandparents, the father's parents come in. And I asked the father, I said, why don't you tell us why you're here, why you wanted to send your son into therapy? And the father gets up and with tremendous pride and pain, he says, you know, I have the perfect family. Who doesn't? My children, ah, my son, Rosh Hashiva of this yeshiva. My second son, Rosh Kailo. My third son gives five shiurim daf yoimi. Five in the morning, six in the morning, eight in the morning, nine in the morning, seven in the evening. My other son already went through Bavli, Yerushalmi, Medrash Rabbah, Tanakh, Tur, Shulchan Aruch, Rambam, the Poiskim. He's a Poiskim right there. The next one is the Sarah Torah. The other son is the founder of Atzala. The other son is the greatest Baal Chesed, the Sarah Chesed of the whole tri-state area, Vahagol. <laughs> my daughters, <laughs> valedictorians. By Siaka, by Sruchel, Bnoi Siyan, Bruria Shalamis, by Srifka, Neve, Chachmas Nushim, everything. Valid and their husbands. <laughs> the future Gedoli Hadar. And then I have my youngest, an embarrassment for himself and the family, sleeps till four o'clock, and then plays games. It's embarrassing for him, it's embarrassing for us, and he's a good head, smarter than everybody else, wastes his days and years. I sent him to therapy. 
Dr. Palkovitz tells me, Rabbi, why, why? The grandfather gets up and looks at everybody, and he says, it looks like my son never internalized what I told him many years ago. So let me share it with my grandchildren. He said, I grew up in Poland. I was a family of 15. My brother sat and learned in the Stiblach in Poland, the Gerish Stiblach in Poland. I had what you would call today ADD, ADHD, PDD, Shmendi. But then in those years, there was one diagnosis for every child, a fraska head and a fraska hip. And some of them were cured, some were not, but there was one diagnosis, you remember, uniform, equally. You put your fingers together, somebody had a stick, that was the diagnosis, it was brilliant, it was pedagogical, you had to have a PhD to diagnose, and it was great. That, I couldn't sit still, but I was street smart, and I knew languages, and I would roam the streets. I just had a, this, this Spitzenfingergefühl. Spitzenfingergefühl. You know what that is? Okay. Spitzenfingergefühl. I had that. I had that sixth sense, the instinct. And one day, it's 1938, I pick up a book, and I read it from cover to cover. The name of the book is Mein Kampf. I read German, so I could read it original. I come home at night, and I say, Tate, Mama, Poland is on the border of Germany. This Meshuggah in Germany is going to do everything he writes in this book. In a few years, Poland is going to be Judenheim. Let's get out of here before it's too late. My father looks at me and says, Hitler's a Meshuggah, like all the Jews said in 1930, Meshuggah, that's a You know, hindsight is 2020. And that's not respect. You're speaking foolish. It's nonsense. If you would sit and learn like your brothers, you wouldn't have time to read these stupid anti-Semitic books. He said, listen, Tata, I should learn like my brothers, but you know that I'm smarter than my brothers. And you know that I have a sixth sense. And I'm telling you, he is going to do what he said he's going to do. Let's get out of here before it's too late. I argued with my parents for three weeks, and they would not listen to me. And I said, father and mother, I'm going to have to leave alone. You will not, he said, be able to understand the tears the night I left my beloved family, and I crossed the Atlantic Ocean, and I made it to the United States of America. And a little while later came September 1st, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. 1945, the war is over, and I discover that nobody in my family has survived. I lost everybody. At that moment, I made a vow for the glory of my parents and my siblings. I'm going to rebuild, and I'm going to be successful. And I rebuilt this beautiful family, and all of you know I'm extremely successful. And each and every one of you in this room is my revenge against Hitler and Eichmann and Himmler and Mengele and Goebbels and Goring and Mashimov. He said, I look around my Einiklach, my grandchildren, and I ask one question. Which grandchild resembles me most in terms of facial features and in terms of disposition? Dr. Palkowitz tells me, it's silence in the room. Everybody knows the answer. He points to this 50-year-old boy and he says, him. He is a carbon copy of his grandfather. And I want you all to realize that it's because of such a child that I'll be there at All of you are here. The fact that you could learn Torah today and thrive spiritually is because of a child like this. Never denigrate him. Never ever denigrate. I dare you to denigrate such a child. Such a child you honor, you respect, you cherish. You can cut the electricity in the room. Dr. Pelkovitz tells me the grandfather finishes. He looks at his son and he says, another word like this, I erase you from the will. He sits down angrily. Dr. Pelkovitz tells me, so I look around and I say, I think this therapy session. <laughs> Everybody leaves. I look at him and say, Dr. Pelkovitz, what's the end of the story? He says, that, that's the story. It happened 25 years ago. I say, what's the end of the story? So the end of the story is the grandfather took him into to run his business. I said, and now? Because now the grandfather is Oedel Mahamas. This boy runs this insanely successful business. And all of his siblings work for him. <laughs> <laughs> he supports all of them. And I thought to myself, perspective. Vantage, vantage point. Had this boy not had such a grandfather to be able to see who he really was. We need to believe in our children so that they can believe in themselves. And we need to believe in ourselves 
so that we can help other people believe in themselves. How is it possible that a people that has been around 4,000 years, a people about who Hashem says, you're my children. I love you. How is it possible that a boy or a girl, a Jewish Yigala, the Megala, could go through our system of yeshivas, base yakovs, girls' schools, boys' schools, chadorim, talmatoides, day schools, yeshivas, but they medrash, koilalim, girls' schools, elementary, high school, yeshiva tani, yeshiva doila, alzgit, from all the Christ. And a huge percentage of them. When you speak to them afterwards, they say to you, oh, I did not feel that I was valued in that institution. I was just dispendable. If I fit in good, if I don't fit in out, we don't need you anymore. We don't need your money. We don't need your numbers anymore. We don't need the numbers. We don't need you. How is it possible? that a child in first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, a girl or a boy throughout our whole system, and I'm talking about any country in the world and any community in the world, can come out from a school not feeling that his or her presence was celebrated, valued, that every teacher, every principal, every rebbe, mashkiach, benal, yeshiva, mora, mora, mechanechas, mechanech, rebbe, tzaddik, Admur, London, Talmud Chachem, look this boy or girl in the eyes and make them feel that you are an indispensable note in the, divine, in the divine cosmic symphony. That you are unique. That your soul was sent down into this world to represent the infinite light of the divine. And you know what? It's not so hard to do. It's just a little shift of a mindset. It's just a little shift of consciousness. It's just looking at people from the perspective of greatness, of godliness, of splendidness, of splendor, of divinity, of eight soifius, of godliness. It's looking at them differently. There was a Jew who lived not far from me, passed away recently. He was a young man, he was a special educator. His name was Rebdovit Trank. And he was a principal of a school in Adelphia, which is in New Jersey, not far from Lakewood. And there was a boy there, a teenager, who hated yeshiva. He couldn't sit still, he didn't like it, he despised it. And he was looking to get thrown out. How do you get thrown out of a yeshiva? I don't know how the system works in the Schweiz, but over there he knew what to do. He told his friend, I know Rabbi Trank's keys to the car are, Friday night, I'm going to steal the keys and drive to a movie theater. Boy says, Shabbos? He says, it's fine, I don't do Shabbos anymore. So he'll steal the car to the Rosh Hashiva on Shabbos, drive to a movie theater. That's like three life sentences, no? <laughs> right? You know, not long ago there was a Jew who got up in the Red Square and he just cleared that Putin is a Meshuggah. They arrested him, and they gave him two life sentences. You know why? Why, why two? It's number one, you insulted the president of Russia. Number two, you revealed the state secret. <laughs> we don't like revealing state secrets. But there comes a time you have to reveal state secrets. If not, you can't grow. You can't see the roots. So this boy was also not very firm, unfortunately. He tells this bachin, he says, take me along with you to the movie theater. He says, Shabbos? He says, you're going. He says, I'll do the sin for me, but not for you. He says, if you don't take me, I'm going to tell Rabbi Trent. He says, that's the point. Tell him, and he'll throw me out. He go, he drives away. He goes to Rabbi Trent's house, and he says, Pliny Ben Pliny stole the keys from the office, went into your car Friday night, and went to a movie theater with your car tonight. He shared the story. Rabbi Trent looks at him and says, Where, where's the movie theater? He says, like two miles. What's the address? Tells him the address. How do you get there? He puts on his coat. It's a winter night in New Jersey. Cold winter night. And he starts walking. He says, where are you going, Rabbi? So I'm going to the movie theater. <laughs> now he was a he had a long black coat. He came from a, 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 a very distinguished Toyota family, a big black hat. He says, where are you going? I'm going to the theater. 
Friday night, right? What should a good Jewish boy from New Jersey do? <laughs> he walks himself in the winter. He goes to the theater. He goes to the, what is it called? <coughs> booth. Vinofman is done. Okay. How do you know Vinofman <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, what happens in Zurich stays in Zurich. <laughs> he comes to the booth and he says, uh, could you let me go in? She says, uh, $8.25, whatever the price was. He says, no, I'm not going to watch. There's somebody there who's very close to me and I just have to give him a message. She says, I can't let people in. He says, look at me. What do I look like? <laughs> it's Sabbath. We don't carry. I don't go to the movies on Tuesday. Saturday, I certainly don't go to the movies. I have no money. I'm a rabbi. Trust me, I'm not going to sit down there. I'm going to speak to somebody for a few seconds. The woman was convinced. She let him go in. He goes in. Now, it was a huge theater. So you have like, I don't know, 10, 15 uh, different, uh, I guess, halls. And now he's looking for him. So he goes from hall to hall. It's pitch dark. And he's trying to find this yeshiva boy. Finally. He spots somebody sitting, and it looks like, from the back, it looks like this bacher. <coughs> so Rabbi Trink goes quietly, because chas v'sholem, you know, asur leval bel v'shas kol So he doesn't want to disturb anybody. The only sound you can hear is popcorn, Pepsi, chips, pretzels maybe, maybe some tears, but that's it. Very quietly, he sneaks up to the boy, and he sits down near him. Now you know, when somebody sits down near you, those of you who are empaths and sensitive to energy, you know when somebody is sitting near you, even if they're not touching you. So this boy just feels, he just feels as an energy. So he turns around, and who does he see? Oh. Rosh Hashiva. <laughs> sitting in the movie theater, Friday night, with a big hat, a long capote, a langa board, right near him in the movie. If there's a moment you want to faint, <laughs> that's the moment. Yeah. Grab Trank? <laughs> what are you doing here? Where are you coming from? Coming from my house. Coming from Yagi. Walk? Yeah, I walk on Charles. <laughs> Two miles? Yeah, it's freezing. I know. Why are you coming? I wanted to ask you. I wanted to tell you something. The popcorn in this movie theater is not kosher. <laughs> <laughs> so do me a favor. Enjoy. Enjoy. But don't buy the popcorn. He says, that's why you came. He says, yeah. How do you know about the popcorn? I did research. <laughs> I have popcorn if you want in my house, I'll give you. I'll get you, but the popcorn here don't eat. He gives him a kiss, a good Shabbos. I love you, take care of yourself, bye bye. Walks out of the movie theater. Tells the woman, you see, I'm good. I didn't watch a movie. <laughs> Starts walking back home. Five minutes later, he feels somebody is near him. He turns around, the boy is there. He says, what are you doing here? You're watching a movie. He says, I can't let you walk home alone. It's the middle of the night, it's freezing. He says, okay, let's walk together. The boy shared the story. They walk home, two miles, freezing. Late at night, Friday night. I don't know if you know the New York, New Jersey winters, yeah? A frost, a frost. So schneid durch the beine, penetrate the, penetrate the bones. Hiking in St. Moritz is already easier. <laughs> he looks at him, and they're talking. He says, a whole way home, Rabbi Trank, he was a funny guy. He's told jokes and stories. That's it, he did, didn't mention a word. No Shabbos, no car, no popcorn, no movie theater. He came home, he walked into the dormitory, gave him a hug, said good Shabbos, and went back home. And the boy who shared the story right after his passing said, in that moment, two things happened. First of all, I remained in yeshiva. And second of all, I never ever broke Shabbos again, ever. So somebody asked Rabbi Trank, who gave you this idea? You know, this is not something in the textbooks, right? If the boy goes to the movie theater on Shabbos and drives, you should put on your coat, and walk two miles, and speak to the woman and say you're a rabbi, and then sit down and talk about popcorn. 
my question is, can we teach these things to people? We can teach a lot of things to people, but I can't give myself or somebody else on the shona. The soul you have to find in yourself. Rabbi Trank had a soul, and he saw the soul in people. And once you see the soul in a child, everything is different. And when he was once talking, he said, a good convention, he said, it's a buffet of Gemara. The Gemara says, how you kind of something? You want to acquire something halachically, what do you do? Hakbar! You lift it up. You lift it up! He said, how do you acquire a child? How are you kind of a student? The answer is, Hakbar! Lift them up. You lift up a person. You lift up a child. You lift up a student. Kaina! That's how you acquire them. I don't acquire somebody by putting them down, by crushing them, by breaking them, by making them feel that I completely don't want them and don't need them. You're a loser. You're the causes of my migraines, my headaches, my depression, my anxiety, and the fact that our family can't get the best shidduchim in Europe. All because of you. That's not how you cover somebody. That's how you reinforce people feeling that they're losers. But when you can lift up yourself, and you could see yourself as a chela kelekam imam. You could see yourself as a shliach of the Rebbeinu Shalayla. Then when you look at a child, you look at a person, an adult, a man, a woman, from any background, you could fulfill that unique mitzvah. Maybe the foundation of all the mitzvahs. La hoidiya levnei ha'adam v'raisav. V'chvayt hadar al chusay. To tell, to teach people about their incredible, incredible, incredible majesty. My dearest friends, you know, when I think about our generation, in many ways, it's the bridge between Chorban and Gula. There's a mission in Prikayavis. We all read it, but as usual, we gloss over it. Chamisha Talmud Mayala Rabbi Yechonah Ben Zak. Rabbi Zak had five students, you remember? And he goes through the five students. Hu Hayamoyne Shvacha. He used to sing their praises. Rebbe Lezabin Orkinus, Rebbe Lezabin Godel, Borsu Che'enui Ma'abi Tipa. He was a cistern of plaster that doesn't lose a drop. Rebbe Lezabin Arach, Rebbe Yeshua, Rebbe Yoisi, Rebbe Shemim Ben Asano. I asked you a question. There were hundreds of Tanoim and Amirayim. We don't find anybody throwing compliments at their students. Why was he the only one, the first one, to be Moyne Shvachim? And he only had five. Why? What was he doing? This was like a Shidduch resume, a Shadchan called him and said, Oh, the Beleza, go, go, What's going on? Who? The answer is, my dearest friends, brothers and sisters, open your hearts. The Yochel ben Zaka was a unique person. He lived in the generation that saw the second base of Mikdash go up in flames. He was the Nasi of the Sanhedrin, Gittin Dafrun Zayin. He met Aspasianus, he met Vespasian, the future emperor of Rome. He is the one who made all the institutions, Zecher le Mikdash, Tsiyayin ein Doirish la, Miklau de Boyd Risha, Rosh Hashanah Sukkah. He is the one, we shake a rule of seven days because of Yochan and Benzaka, he wanted us to remember the Beis Mikdash. And he knew that in such a generation, you can't lose talent. In such a generation, you can't afford to squander the creativity of our youth. He wasn't there to tell compliments. Who are the He praised them so that they should be able to see in themselves what he saw in them. He brought it out. The Beleza HaGadol can now look in the mirror and see in himself what his Rebbe saw in him. That's how he secured that there will be a leadership in Judaism that will maintain the eternity of Netzach Yisrael when the Beis HaMikdash went up in flames, Jerusalem was decimated, and the flame of Klal Yisrael came the closest ever to be extinguished. After that, the Holocaust. He ensured that the candle won't be extinguished because he taught people how to really believe in their infinite divine majesty. And in many ways I feel, this is my answer to your question, Rabbi Rappaport. I see this with clarity of vision about our generation. 
We have so much dormant talent. Every child I see is a little Mozart. Every girl, every boy. There's so much truth, authenticity, depth, insens sensitivity, creativity. Also trauma. Yes, epigenetics. Our genes inherit the trauma of 2,000 years, but also the faith and the wisdom and the love and the mysterious nefesh and the chachma. But our minds have to go to the B'yaychina ben Zakkai. Hu ha yamayin Don't be stingy with words. Don't be stingy with emotions. Most importantly, never be stingy with your infinite heart opening up and embracing each and every one of our people. And by extension, each and every person that exists. And here I finally conclude with this unique insight. There's a medrash, very relevant to these days, the three weeks. It's a medrash plea. It's one of those enigmatic medrash, and we say every morning in Tehillim Sukkot Zimra, Boyne Yerushalayim Hashem, Nidchi Yisrael Yechanes. Hashem builds Jerusalem, the scattered of Israel, he will gather. Says the Medrash Pliyah, Even though Hashem builds Yerushalayim, still he will bring in the Jews. What does the Medrash mean? What's it mean? Even though, why not? Just because he builds it, he shouldn't bring in the Jews? It's one of those Medrash, that when you read it, it's like, okay, I don't get it, Medrash Pliyah. I want to share with you an insight that the Lubavitcher Rebbe of blessed memory once shared. He made a hadrin of Siyam on Meseches Baba Metzir. It was Yutas Kislev Tavshin Chavav, December 1965. This is how he explained the Medrash based on an idea of his grandfather, Yitzhak Tzedek. There's a mission in Baba Metzir, Dav Kuf Yud Zayin Amir Aleph, Perik Abayiz Valiyah. Says the Mishnah. Habayiz Vahaliyah. Here's the situation. You're living in Zurich. Do you have any buildings that have two stories? Or Altas Huh? There's two stories? Okay. You have two condominiums, two stories. On the first floor is Yankel. On the second floor is Zundel. They get along very nice, like neighbors, you know? You don't perfectly get along, Chas but they're, they're, they're very good. They're very good. The bias. Yankel is on the first floor, Zundel is on the second floor. You have Chaya, you have Sprinze, everything is wonderful. One day comes a situation, a hurricane, a fire, another natural disaster, and the structure, Nuflu. It's destroyed. There's no first floor, there's no second floor, the house is in ruins. What's the halach? So the Mishnah says it's very simple. Yankel rebuilds the first floor, Zumbul rebuilds the second floor. That's it. Gemara's day, Mishnah's days, there was no house insurance. So they don't discuss about that option. But however you spin it, with internet, you rebuild it. Comes Yankel to Zundel, says the Mishnah, and says, you know what? I decided I'm moving from Zurich to St. Moritz. Or I'm moving to Yerushalayim. Or I'm moving to New York. I'm moving to Borough Park. I'm not rebuilding my first story apartment. Zundel says, I can't rebuild the second floor without the first floor. I need beams, I need foundations, I need the roof of your house, I should have a floor on my second floor. I can't! It's not my problem! That's the mission. What do you do? So the Mishnah says, Zundel can rebuild the lower apartment and live there. You rebuild Yankel's house, he moved to Borough Park, yeah? So the live in the Borough Park. You, you, you rebuild the first floor, and you live there. Yankel comes for a visit. He has a big chassan in Zurich. So he comes for a visit to Schlesinger Chassan, or whichever chassan it was. <laughs> <laughs> My shot. <laughs> so he comes, he comes to the, okay, the Rubenfeld chassan, or whatever it is. He comes in, he comes, he comes into the Zurich. He walks into his old apartment. Zundo, es geht gemacht. Borough Park is not for me. I think I like the Schweiz. I like, I like the cheese. I like the clock. I like the Pinklichkeit. I like the cleanliness. I like the Kinstlerischkeit. I like the Balabatischkeit. I like the precision. Fed eine Minute. 
a lecture that's called for eight, starts at eight. <laughs> okay, you have somebody from Brooklyn, a month, so it starts 8.13, but not 9.13, 10.13. I like it. I like it. I'm coming back. It's my house. So the Mishnah says, what do you do? The Mishnah says like this. He could come back. He has to pay up what Zundel spent to rebuild the first floor, pay him back the money, you move into your house, and now he has money, he can either rebuild the second floor, or move to Bar Park, or Palm Beach, or St. Maritz, or Lagano, whoever. Zolza, a mission above Metzia Kofiud Zion. That's the mission. I just gave it a few names. Every mission can be learned technically, practically. It's talking about a house, two condominiums, a yankel mit a zundel, a chayim mit a sprinze, a hurricane, a tsunami, building, construction, money. But every Mishnah can also be understood on a spiritual level. Said the Rebbe, Habayiz v'aliyah is referring to the house and the aliyah, the second floor. What is that? Yaakov Avinu dreams about the ladder on the earth that reaches heaven. He wakes up and he says, This is the portal to heaven. What does Rashi say? There's a Beis Hamikdash down here, a bias. But above the Beis Hamikdash, there's a heavenly Beis Hamikdash. There's an Aliyah. There's a spiritual sanctuary. Vishakhanti Bisaikim, not just the physical. There's an aliyah. The Gemara says in Tain is Dafe, there's Yerushalayim Shalmata, and there's Yerushalayim Shalmaila. Some Khelbig wrote a book called Varsha Shalmaila. There's Yerushalayim Shalmata, there's the Jerusalem below, but there's the Jerusalem above. Yerushalayim Shalmaila. What does this mean? It means the physical Jerusalem, when you go to your Shalayim, you're not just watching buildings and structures and eating Strauss ice cream and Lafa with Shwama. That too. But there's a Yerushalayim Shalmaila. There's a spiritual divine majesty that lives in the metaphysics of the ambiance of Yerushalayim. There was a poet in Israel, her name was Zelda. She wrote, when I went into Yerushalayim the first time after 67, Shachachti et Shmi, I forgot my name. She melted away in the all-encompassing ecstasy of Knesset Yisrael. Habayiz v'aliyah. V'zesh ara shamayim. The Shechemim lived well together. Klal Yisrael lived in Yerushalayim Shalomata, and the Rebbein Yisraelim lived in Yerushalayim Shalomayla. Bayis and Ali. Did they always get along? Of course not. But more or less, they were very good. Then comes the Churban Beis HaMikdash. And what happens? The bias is completely burnt. Burned to the ground by the Babylonians, by the Romans. But you know what else gets destroyed? The Aliyah. Why? The Zayar says in Parshish Nasai, Nishba HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I think they made a song, no? Isn't there a song, huh? Emes? Yeah, Nishba, some, one of the, but the Zayar comes before Mardukha, if I'm not mistaken. Nishba HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem is not moving back to Yerushalayim Shalmaila as long as his children don't move back to Yerushalayim Shalmat. Hashem said he's not coming back to the Aliyah as long as the bias is not rebuilt. You know, Tisha B'av, we say nothing. Over there we speak about Yerushalayim. You know what we say? Hashemema me'ein Yoshev. Jerusalem is desolate without anybody living there. How could you say that honestly? Anybody thought about this last year, Tisha B'Av? Hashemim, you know how many Jews live in Yerushalayim? Hashemim, there were even those, Chachamim, who said we have to change the tefillah. It's not Hashemim, man, Yerushalayim. Wherever you go, it's a level of the in Yerushalayim. It's a little too hectic. <laughs> Traffic jams don't come from places where there's no people. The truth is they're missing the point. The Imre Emes, the Gary Rebbe said, Hashemim, man, Yerushalayim. It doesn't say Yerushalayim. It says Yoshev. Yerushalayim Shalmaila. That's Yerushalayim. And that's desolate. Hashem swore that he's not coming in Yerushalayim Shalmat. It says in Parshas Masah, Zoy Sa'aretz Asher Tipoy Lochem L'Nachala. This is the land that's going to fall. The Ramban says, a land falls? Where's a land fall? And he says, there's Eretz Yisrael Shalmaila that has to fall into Eretz Yisrael Shalmat. Eretz Yisrael has two layers, bias and an aliyah. Comes the Churban and they're destroyed. 
Hashem is not in the Aliyah, the Jews are not in the bias. So what does the Mishnah say what has to happen? Everybody has to rebuild their story. The Jewish people need to rebuild their story. Their gebede, their shtok. And then the Rebbeinu Shalom comes back to the Aliyah, to his shtok. How do you rebuild Yerushalayim? Toysva says in Tainis Dafyud, Yerushalayim is a combination of two words, Yira Shalom. Complete year is Hashem. So the Bala Ali Hashem comes to the Bala Bayis, to the Jew, and says, Yankala, Yisraelik, my dear Tayyidi, do me a favor. Rebuild your house. Rebuild your Shalayim. Rebuild your base. I the Rambam says in Hilchis Truva paid exile. If Tichas is Toyda, Shasayf Yisrael, Vasas Truva, Besayf Galusun, Umiyad Hei Nigal. Return. Shuvu Elai, Vashuvu Aleichem, rebuild the house, I'll rebuild the Aliyah, and we'll live together happily ever after. Comes Amalei Balabayis Labal Aliyah. Comes the Balabayis to the Bal Aliyah, and he says, I'm moving to Barbar. I'm moving to Miami. I'm moving somewhere else. We're not talking physically now. In Gaulus, Jews live all over the world. He says, I don't want to rebuild the Balabayis. I have new interests, I have new dreams, I have new ideas. As you know, throughout the 2,000 years of exile, we have developed many different isms, many different alternatives. Rabbi Rappaport mentioned we have 50 million Jews, 2 million, 3 million sit at the Seder table. Most, we look for different homes, different places to live, different places to get satisfaction. Even in our own, how many of us know that we're looking for different sources of satisfaction to fill our void? to dull our anxiety, to compensate ourselves for our emptiness. I'm not interested in rebuilding this home. And the time goes on, and the place remains desolate. And he continued and said, when the Eberster can't change place halten, the Tsar, the Rebbein Shalom can't deal with the pain of Shechinta Begalusa, and the Jewish people in Galus, do you know what he does? He rebuilds the bias. He rebuilds the first floor. Hashem rebuilds the first floor. He rebuilds Yerushalayim Shalmata. He can't deal with staying away. <coughs> oh, the Jewish people see a beautiful Yerushalayim. They say, I love this place. I'm coming. And then he used these words in Yiddish. He said, And yet, the very Lechari, the bitter. And now, you would think it becomes bitter. Why? Because the Baal Ali says, pay back all the expenses. Pay back everything I put in. How do you pay back God? Midik de mami var How do you pay back? Pay back all the expenses. I built this. Pay me back. If not, you can't go in. That's what you would think is the conclusion of the Mishnah. Comes the Medrash and says, Afal pisha boyli Yerushalayim Hashem. Even though the Rebbein Shalom rebuilds Yerushalayim, so you would think it's very hard to get in because you have to pay up all the expenses. He's going to bring in every Jew. Why? And the answer is because in this case, Yankel and Zundel are not two neighbors. In this case, it's a father and a child. It's a mother and a child. And a mother wants to live with her child. A father wants to live with their child. That's why it says boine in the present and yechanes in the future. Grammatically, it's incorrect. Either say boine Yerushalayim Hashem Nidchei Yisrael Mechanes or Yivne Yerushalayim Hashem Nidchei Yisrael Yechanes. The answer is he rebuilds and still he will gather in all of the Jewish people. That's the meaning of the Mishnah on a spiritual level. This is what the Lubavitcher Rebbe shared. I say this now in parentheses. Call it what you want. This was December 1965. Yutas Kislev Tavshin Chavav. 17 months later. 17 months later. What happened? The Yerubayin Shalaylam, in a historic gift, gave Yerushalayim back to the Jewish people. Let me tell you something. Those who know Israeli history know the leadership of the Israeli government fought this tooth and nail. The last thing Levi Eshkol, Moshe Dayan, and Yitzchak Rabin wanted was the old city of Jerusalem. 
as Yerabin. Rabin was the chief of staff. Moshe Dayan was defense minister. Levi Eshkol was the prime minister of Israel. Aleya Mashal. They were allergic to the old city. I don't want to deal with the Vatican. I don't want to deal with the mosques. Do me a favor. Give me Tel Aviv. In fact, they begged and pleaded with King Hussein from Jordan not to mix into the war. Syria is at war. Egypt is at war. They told Hussein, don't mix in. Live and let live. We won't bother you. He, he, was, he was in charge of the old city of Jerusalem. King Hussein was duped by Nasser from Egypt, who deceived him that Egypt was victorious. And he shelled and shelled and shelled. Uzi Narkis was trying to get the agreement from the government to recapture Jerusalem. They wouldn't. And I don't know if you know this, it was Menachem Begin who was in the opposition, who would listen to BBC every night, 12 o'clock a.m., from the days when he was busy fighting the British during the mandate. He would listen to BBC. And he realized the next morning the UN is going to call for a ceasefire. And he called Eshkel in the middle of the night, and they had the one and only Knesset meeting that they still call today the pajama meeting. Because <laughs> everybody was virtually in pajamas, 3 o'clock a.m. Eshkel said, I can't make an agreement myself. And they got the permission to retake Jerusalem. The next morning, Chav 28th of year 19, Chav Kas Ir Tav Shem Chav Zayin, June 7th, 1967, 10 o'clock a.m., Motke Gur declared those three historic words, Har Habayit Biyadeno. They didn't want it, they didn't expect it. In fact, because they didn't fight aggressively, a quarter of the casualties of the Six Day War were the soldiers in Jerusalem, in Yerushalayim. This was 17 months after the seal of the Rebbe on Meseches Baba Metziah Bar Habayiz Valiyah, which he said with tears and choked in emotion, as the Shechina Kenesh Vartin, and Hashem says, I'm going to rebuild Yerushalayim because I want to be with you. Because I want to be with you. Nitche Yisrael Yechanas. And when I heard this, it gave me a flavor and an awareness of what it means to empower yourself to empower others, what it means to empower a generation. We could look at ourselves and our children in two ways. We could look at ourselves as essentially alien, outcasts, sinners, strangers. You're guilty till proven innocent, but that's a Christian doctrine. It's called original sin. The perspective that we see here in this Pasuk is a completely different perspective. You're mine. You're my king. You're my child. Not only do I love you, I am infinitely proud of you. I have infinite proud in you, pride in you. And that's why look at the next Pasek. What's the connection? Come on, you're saying this for 60 years. What's the connection? Anybody knows? Now you understand. He heals the brokenhearted. He bandages their wounds. What's the connection? He gives numbers to stars. What's the connection? The connection is, you know how many stars there are? Anybody knows the number? Come on, from IBM, you learned the number of the stars? Huh? I'm not going to tell you how many stars there are, first of all, because I don't know. And second of all, that's one reason. My second reason is, because even if I say a whole night won't be enough to go through the numbers of the stars. L'chulam sheim sikra. Every star has a name. No star is a mistake. No star is just a random error of 15.3 years of cosmology, cosmological development. Dorach koichav miyakoiv. Every Jew is a star. L'chulam sheim sikra. I want you with me. I want you in my home. This is the perspective of the idea that allows us to move in, not just to the physical Yerushalayim, but equally important, to rebuild the spiritual Yerushalayim, the Yerushalayim of Yerushalayim, so there could be the complete reunion of the Bayis and the Aliyah. Amen. 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 This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.